Good afternoon and welcome to the Alex webinar on the role of long-term storage in digital curation. The second of a series of two webinars entitled From the Digital Dark Ages to a Digital Renaissance. I'm Maria Pincus, a virtual member of the Alex Continuing Education Committee and I'll be your host for this afternoon's webinar. Today's speakers will be Laura Osterhout and Erin Rhodes. Laura Osterhout is Member Services Librarian at the Rochester Regional Library Council in Fairport, New York. She has presented sessions on virtual preference, the basics of digitization projects, metadata, content DM, and digital preservation basics to various audiences throughout New York State at the New York Library Association Conference, at the Content DM Eastern Users Meeting, and at the Reference Renaissance Conference. Erin Rhodes, Digital Projects and Education Coordinator at Colby College Special Collections in Waterville, Maine, has presented informally on basic approaches to the digitization of archival and special collections materials, technical metadata, and on teaching and using primary sources in archives to various audiences, including archival colleagues. Colby faculty and students. A few things to keep in mind during today's presentation. GoToWebinar does not have interactive chat capabilities, but if you wish to comment during today's session using Twitter, you may use the hashtag you see on the screen. If you have any questions for the presenters, please type them into the box entitled Questions. These will be answered as time permits at the end of the presentation. Questions which remain unanswered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the responses sent to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded. You should be receiving an email with a link to the recording, the presentation slides, and an evaluation form for the webinar within two days. Now, as I turn the presentation over to Erin, there may be a slight delay. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you, Maria, for the nice introductions. Uh, and also thanks to Alex for giving us the opportunity to facilitate this webinar today. And thank you to all of you for attending. So um, this presentation is called From the Digital Dark Ages to a Digital Renaissance, The Role of Long-Term Storage in Digital Curation. Sort of a hefty title, um, but the term Digital Dark Ages came about 15 or so years ago to describe the potential large-scale loss of our exploding digital culture. At the time, no one completely understood how to preserve or archive digital objects. So there was a strong feeling that what we were producing digitally was doomed to be lost in the digital black hole. Today, we not only have more knowledge about digital preservation and how to approach it, but we have international standards and here in the U.S. several really great national collaborative efforts to guide us, as well as a lot of shared expertise. So in 2012, we're not peering into a digital dark age or black hole anymore. We're actually at the front end of a digital renaissance, which is a good place to be. So as Maria said, my name is Erin Rhodes, and I am the Archival Education and Digital Projects Coordinator at Colby College Special Collections in lovely Waterville, Maine. I am co-host today along with our leading presenter, Laura Osterhout, who is the Member Services Librarian at the Rochester Regional Library Council in Fairport, New York. Laura will deliver a very engaging presentation today on a topic that we are no doubt all confronting in our work. Um, so quickly, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on um, how this webinar came to be. Um, Laura and I first met last fall. We were both selected to take part in the Library of Congress's inaugural Digital Preservation Outreach and Education, or DPOE, Train the Trainer Workshop in Washington, D.C. The DPOE is a relatively new department in the Library of Congress's Digital Preservation Program. So you can see DPO's mission here on, on this slide. Um, essentially, the Library of Congress is working to create a nationwide network of trainers 
that will go out into the library and cultural resources communities to encourage the active preservation of our digital heritage. This collaborative network will help us to help each other preserve digital content. As we connect and share information, tools, and methods, we will raise awareness of the issues involved and lay the groundwork that will enable us all to work together to face some of the very difficult challenges that lie ahead. I have also included the link to the DPOE um, website if you're interested in learning more about the program. Um, I believe they intend to hold additional train the trainer workshops all around the country um, in the future. So you might want to um, check the website to see if that's going to be happening in your area. And they also maintain a digital preservation education calendar of events that may also be of interest to you. So what we're presenting today comes directly from the training modules designed by the DPOE program. This webinar is the second of what will be a four-part series. All the webinars complement each other and the modules build on each other to inform the overall development of your institution's digital preservation program. But each web webinar can certainly be taken by itself if you are only interested in the specific aspect of digital preservation. So here, this slide sort of lists the six modules designed by the DPOE program. They introduce fundamental, broad concepts for managing your digital content over time and are meant to be conceptual steps that define basic components of planning for digital preservation. They are geared towards providing an overview for practitioners and managers of digital content who are new to this practice. The first two modules, Identify and Select, were presented in October, and some of you may have had a chance to attend that webinar. That webinar introduced the concepts of identifying and selecting the content you intend to preserve. This process lays the groundwork for the next steps by establishing the scope of digital materials that are within your responsibility as an institution to maintain over time. You have to identify, select, prioritize, and organize content so you can responsibly store and manage it. Today's webinar covers the third module in the series, Store. This module addresses considerations for long-term storage, what to store, in what formats, and options for how to store it. Digital content that has been identified and selected for preservation should be stored in ways that align with good practice, such as storing multiple copies in more than one physical location. Well thought out storage strategies are an important part of the long-term management of digital content to ensure that it sticks around through successive generations and iterations of technology. In the spring, we have proposed two additional webinars to complete this series. One will cover the issue of protecting your digital content from various threats. And a final webinar will cover modules five and six, managing digital content and providing access to it. So now that we've talked a little bit about ourselves and about the DPOE program, um, I wanted to turn to you. Um, we have participants today from all across the country, from Alaska to Florida, from California to New York, Texas to Illinois, Tennessee to DC area, and I think even the Cayman Islands, which is pretty awesome. Um, not only that, we have a variety of different types of organizations represented, and I've listed some of them here. I point this out just because it shows the variety of institutions that are taking on digital preservation initiatives. And even if you look at Laura and I, she works in a regional library network, and I work in a small college library. We're from two very different environments. Because of this, the content we're presenting is more broad than specific. Our aim is to provide you with a conceptual foundation for your program, something you can build on based on the knowledge of your institution, its mission, and its priorities. Okay, so um, we'd like to do a quick poll. Um, this will be one of several polls we'll do during the webinar. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to describe your current level of knowledge or familiarity with digital preservation. Do you see yourself as a novice, an intermediate, an advanced, or an expert? So I will start the poll here and give you a few moments to respond.
Okay, so it looks like there's a skew towards the intermediate um, with smaller amount of novice and sort of middle of road for advanced. Um, so that's that's good. Um, I think the pool is sort of about 50 people, but probably more since I know there's groups of people, but collectively um, the bulk of everyone's falling into intermediate. Um, I just wanted to um, do this to note that the program is designed primarily for beginners and novices among you, but hopefully the advanced folks will also get something out of our presentation today. <clears throat> so to finish up, at the end of today's presentation, we hope you will have a better understanding of the requirements for storing digital content and approaches to meeting those requirements. Um, uh, understand how metadata makes content identifiable and usable over time and that it needs to be stored along with the content itself. And understand how storage decisions fit within a larger preservation program or plan. So with that, I will hand things over to Laura. There may be a slight delay as we switch part, uh, presentations. Okay, hi everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Let me get my slideshow going here for you. Okay, um, it's great to be here today and thanks Erin for the uh, wonderful introduction. I'm really excited to be here to be able to share um, the storage part of the curriculum with, with everybody. Um, and I'd like to again thank um, Alex for hosting the webinar and for um, asking Erin and I to present and um, thank the Library of Congress again for their, um, you know, uh, great curriculum that they've designed and for um, training us and allowing us to share this with everyone because it's obviously a um, very important issue, you know, considering all of the people that we have on the uh, webinar today. So let's begin um, with this part of the webinar series. And you'll see that um, the initial slide here says Part 3, Store, and we, um, Aaron kind of um, explained a little bit about why this is the part three, and, and I'll, we'll get back into the uh, curriculum in just a second. But let me um, do a quick poll with you. I would just wanted to find out how many of you were um, had attended the webinar on October 10th. So what I'm going to do is launch the poll and just give you a few seconds to respond to that. Um, and Erin did a, a really good job of encapsulating what um, was covered during that uh, initial webinar. So I just wanted to get an idea of how many people have already been through that. Um, so I won't need to reiterate too many things if we are, we're looking good on that. Um, so it looks like we, are, we have a lot of responses here. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share those results with you. And you can see that um, the majority of the people on the webinar today were actually present during the first um, webinar on October 10th. So that's great. You've got a really good background um, for the two, um, the two initial uh, modules that we covered. So I'm going to go and hide, I'm gonna hide the results and move on to the next slide. So um, Aaron showed you this. These are the six modules that, um, are, that make up the Library of Congress digital preservation curriculum. And during the previous webinar on October 10th, the Identify and Select areas were covered. Um, and Aaron gave you a pretty good background on that, so I'm not I'm going to go over that too much with you, other than to say uh, identification and selection of digital content is extremely important, and it's very good preparation for what we're going to talk about today, which are um, the issues related to long-term storage. Um, when, pardon me, I'm just getting over a cold, so if I do any, like, you know, throat clearing or coughing, please forgive me. All right. Um, we're going to proceed with the meat of the presentation in just a second, but what I wanted to do is actually call your attention um, to the three other modules that are on the page that will be um, hopefully presented in the spring, as Erin mentioned, and I'd like you to actually try and think about these things while we are talking about storage today. Um, because a lot of the decisions that you make 
um, around storage will also potentially impact these other areas of digital preservation. Um, so, you know, think about is, is your chosen storage method able to provide any protections for your content over time? Uh, what tools will you need to help manage your content that you're storing? And then does your storage method allow for providing content to users in the future? So let's think about these things as we continue on and talk about storage needs. So what are our needs going to be? Now before we really have a discussion on that, we should make clear what we're talking about storing. Um, now archival storage talks about managing content as objects. Now what does that exactly mean? Well, Digital content in the context that we're talking about it equals files plus metadata. So if you've ever worked on a digitization project where you, you know, put um, images online or anything like that, you're probably familiar with this concept that um, the files themselves um, can't stand alone. They need metadata to help explain what's in the file, help people understand it, and help systems be able to interact with it. So that's basically what we're talking about when we talk about um, digital content and objects. So I may use those terms um, interchangeably um, during this presentation, but that's basically what we're talking about. So if you think about um, the digital content that you may have at your institution, there's probably a wide range of formats. So um, you may, depending on your decisions at your institution, decide to preserve any type of thing, images, sound, video, whatever. Um, you may also, if you're currently working on digitization projects, you may also be capturing certain types of metadata about your digital content. Um, but when we go through the presentation today, you, you may um, learn some new types of data that you want to capture that are going to aid you in preservation. And we're going to, we'll talk about um, metadata. There's a few slides dedicated to that in just a minute. Now, the, the other thing that we should get on the table right away is the concept of how many copies do I need? Um, and, and, you know, there's a, another slide about copies specifically later on in the presentation, but at the bottom line is, um, is the fact that you need at least two copies of something to ensure that it's preserved minimally. Um, any less than that and you only have one copy, which is very bad. Um, and I've actually had this happen to me where I'm sure we've all had this experience where we you know, were meaning to back this thing up and oh, or I lost my cell phone and it was the only copy of those pictures that I had. So I think we can all, um, we're all familiar with the concept that you need more than one copy of something to ensure that it's going to be preserved in, in some manner. So let's talk about um, well-managed collections and what do we mean by that? Basically, um, we need to manage our collections in such a way that um, makes preservation easier. Um, so likely your institution um, already has uh, digital collections or even analog collections. You know, if I'm not in an actual library, um, but I know people still have books and things like that. So um, you're used to grouping things into collections. Well, you're, um, the content that you're going to preserve long term is, is going to be also grouped into collections um, based on criteria that you've determined. So we have to think about recording, you know, basic information for each thing that we deposit into our storage system. We also need to cover what is the minimal metadata that we want to capture. Um, now, I've been sort of thinking about this deposit idea in the context of a savings account. Um, so, for example, um, the whole point of savings accounts is it you want to save money long term, right? Well, that's kind of the way you can look at long term storage for digital preservation. So you want to make a deposit um, with the goal of keeping that money. Whether or not it's successful, it's a different story. But um, with each deposit, not only will you have the money that you're putting in, but you'll also have um, a record of the transaction, the time, the date, things like that. Now, there may be other things that you want to record about that deposit or about the data or the content that you're inputting. Um, and that's, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the metadata area. 
And then also when you're working with your collections, um, be cognizant of the formats that you're working with. And you're going to want to basically decide to preserve only certain formats or preserve things um, in normalized formats. So these are formats that, um, that are widely used in the community, um, formats that probably will be able to be migrated in the future, things that are um, widely accepted. You know, uh, you, you don't necessarily want to preserve a WordPerfect file at this point. You may want to turn it into something else. And then for your, um, your storage, uh, you have to make sure that it's controlled and known. And, and basically what that means is that, um, that you're confident in it, that you know what's being stored, you, what you expect to be there is, is there, and that kind of thing. And then again, to reiterate the multiple copies in at least two locations. And we will um, spend a little bit more time talking about the location factor a little bit later. But these are just some of the, the backbone ideas to keep in mind when you're talking about storage and you're trying to make decisions about this. So let's have the metadata discussion. I know metadata is, uh, you know, it's one of those things that we, um, we could spend all day talking about depending on the audience. And um, I've been working on digitization projects for a very long time, and it's one of those issues that uh, just, you know, it gets people going. We're not going to get into it in a very specific way. We're going to talk in more general terms about metadata, um, but it's, it's extremely important, especially in digital preservation, so I really want to spend some time um, making that clear to you today. So let's think about questions about our objects. Um, and this would be something that you're going to deposit into a storage system and save for the long term. How are you going to know what the object actually is? What kind of information is going to tell you that? How will the content be usable in the future? So what do you need to know in order to be able to use and understand what you're saving in the long term? And then how do you know an object is authentic? Why is it there? Where did it come from? Is it what it's supposed to be? So metadata can really help us um, answer some of these questions. And if we do it right, um, we'll really ensure that we're able to save our uh, data long term. So how do you know what an object is? Metadata uniquely identifies a digital object. It will tell you that this object is this object, and it's not all these other objects. It will differentiate it from other things and um, be, uh, uniquely identify a particular thing. And that's very important. If anybody's ever um, had problems with file names on a, uh, like a work server, which I have, um, it's very hard to find anything if you don't have other data to help you locate something. So unique identifier. And then how do you use your content in the future? Um, metadata will make your objects understandable. So what information do you need to be able to find, use, and understand something in the future? Um, you probably need descriptive and contextual information, um, technical and administrative info, things like that will help users interact with the item and will um, enable computer systems to interact with it. Um, so the, uh, using the content in the future is basically the whole point of digital preservation. So I can't stress the importance of this enough. And then, um, how do you know the object is authentic? Um, metadata will allow you to trace the object over time. So there will be a record of where this thing came from, um, that it's in, in the uh, collection it's supposed to be in, uh, that there's um, nothing wrong with it. There's uh, other components to this we'll talk about later, but basically it's to uh, lend authenticity to the objects. So all these things enable us to preserve our content long term. And we're going to actually, we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of metadata that you may already be capturing. And then I'd, I'd like you to think about um, some of the things that you may not be capturing already. So um, the first thing you're probably familiar with is administrative metadata. And it's information that helps you or um, maybe a computer system manage the content in some way. 
This could include um, who owns the item, who has the authority to access it, um, what processes can be run on it, that type of thing. Now, um, structural data will help with uh, usability and understanding relationships that this content has to other content. So there could be um, internal structure to something. For example, if um, you're, you're depositing a content which is um, a book, there will be an internal structure to that book and likely smaller objects that fit within the larger object. Um, and, or there might be an, like an external type of relationship where this particular object or content is related to some other object. Maybe it's one you know, photograph and, me and associated metadata record that's part of a larger collection that you want to make note of. So that's uh, structural. Now descriptive metadata is um, probably the thing that we all spend the most time on and um, if you've ever done a digitization project you probably have spent the most time creating things like um, subject headings, descriptions, notes, things along the line of a catalog record, that's kind of how I see the descriptive metadata. Enables you, the user, and the system to find and use the data. And um, there's probably other things that can fall into this category, um, but mostly the, I think the descriptive uh, subject headings and the descriptions of the content is what, what we'll, we spend the most time working on in this area. And then there's preservation metadata which, as you can see by the diagram here, basically overlaps all the other areas of metadata. So, you, you know, you're probably already familiar with or capturing some of this metadata for your digital content, but maybe you haven't thought about it in this way yet. So, I'm going to go through what all of these things mean. Um, so, there's content data. What's included in the object? Fixity information is basically the bits and bytes of the electronic files. Provenance um, is kind of like the chain of custody, who created this, where did it come from, that kind of thing. Um, reference data is again with that unique identifier, it identifies the um, object as this object and no other object. Um, and contextual data is how is this object related to other things. So you can see where, where the preservation type of metadata really does overlap um, with the other three areas here. So just want to reiterate a couple of um, concepts about these preservation metadata because it is extremely important and um, since it's already some, part of this is something we may be capturing already, I think it's not that much of a stretch that we could um, capture a little bit more. So, uh, on the content, what is the substance, substance of the object? object? What's in it? Um, objects, as we said uh, earlier, are made up of uh, metadata and files. So what is in this object? And this could even include um, the intellectual content, so to speak. Now, fixity, we haven't really talked in depth about what fixity is, but some of you may be familiar with the concept. Um, fixity checking is basically checking the bits and bytes that uh, make up files in order to ensure that they stay constant over time. So electronic files are vulnerable to degrading like everything else um, and so it's imperative to check the fixity bits and bytes on a periodic basis to ensure that the content is um, un undamaged and unchanged. It's very important. Um, now, reference data just identifies the object as what it is, differentiates it from other things, um, and it's very useful and important when you start to um, store and save more and more things. So the unique identifier is um, extremely important. In provenance data, tracing the file or tracing the um, object to its origin which could be its origin in the world or it could be its origin um, is being deposited into the preservation system. So a clear record of uh, where it came from, when it was saved, um, 
who's you know interacted with it, that type of information. And then contextual data, again, is is how the object's related to other objects. Um, you know, and, and this, and particularly this contextual data piece about preservation metadata, I see is overlapping with the structural data that we're already kind of capturing. Uh, so hopefully this is um, made it a little more clear to you how, uh, not only how important the metadata, preservation metadata is, but how it's, already, it's very related to what we're already capturing in the, you know, the projects that we've worked on. And hopefully um, we can do more of this as we start to store our objects. Now let's move on and talk about the uh, number of copies. We said in the beginning <laughs> that the minimum number of copies is two copies. Um, but maybe that's not enough. Uh, maybe in your particular situation, more copies are in order. Um, optimally, six copies is suggested. Now, you may ask, where does this six number come from? And there's no real you know, hard and fast rule about six copies is the absolute you know, ideal situation, but it's sort of the number that's most often cited in the preservation community. Um, so, you know, therefore, it's it's a decent benchmark. However, um, there's a lot of factors that are going to impact how many copies of something you're going to want to save, or you know, uh, what you do with your storage. So, for example, um, if you're preserving video files, they are extremely large, and it may be pretty much impractical to save more than two copies of that somewhere because of the, the size of the file and the cost of storage and you know, various other factors like that. Um, possibly, you may be preserving content that has some you know, sensitive nature to it. So there may be legal restrictions on you know, how many copies you can make or where they can be stored. Um, if you're, you know, working with sensitive data or financial information, um, there are legal restrictions on some of that. So you really need to be aware of that. Now, let's go through some of the different issues related to storage media. Now, we can probably all think of a few examples of storage media that you already use. For example, at my office here, um, I have one file server, it's networked to the office and you know we save all of our uh, working documents on that. I also have a couple USB drives, I have an external hard drive um, and things like that. So we already are probably all using some various storage media. Um, let's talk about the options that we actually have to work with. Online, um, you you might immediately, when you think of online storage, you might think of cloud storage. Um, and that's definitely an option. Um, I would also consider online, um, like my file server at work, to be online because I happen to be able to um, connect to it from any computer where I have an internet connection. So these are places where your, um, your stored uh, content is easily accessible, it can be retrieved quickly, that kind of thing. Uh, Nearline might be um, an external hard drive situation or even um, a storage situation where your content is not necessarily accessible immediately from an online computer but can be gotten to quickly. And we'll talk about some of the um, options for storage in that manner. And then offline um, basically would be something that's, I don't, it's not, I don't want to call it dark dark archive or dark storage, but it's basically a non-moving type of thing. It would be maybe a DVD, uh, some DVDs that are stored with, you know, backup copies of images and metadata or something like that. Um, and this would be a storage option which is not easily accessible or quickly accessible in the event that you need to restore anything. So uh, those are the three types of storage options. Now what else should we think about? <laughs> cost. This is always a factor and um, even with cloud storage getting cheaper and cheaper, um, nothing is free as we all know. So the amount of financial resources that your institution has, you know, available is just going to impact your decision on storage options. 
uh, quantity, how much stuff do you actually need to store? Um, the size of files has an impact, the number of files. Um, of course, the more you know that you need to store for the long term, probably the you know more resources it will take to make that happen. Expertise. Um, this is you know when I think about expertise, I try and liken this to the open source issues. You know, like open source is free, quote unquote free, but it um, requires skills um, and expertise to manage it. Uh, so you have to consider what expertise you have at your institution and how your chosen storage method, you know, how that will, they will impact each other. Um, you may have the option to bring in a partner, which is um, really nice, if you have perchance a sister organization or an organization that you work with on projects um, that hopefully is geographically separated from you, um, if you could ask them to store your content and perhaps you could reciprocally store their content, that would be a nice way to achieve a little bit of you know, preservation um, without expending too much effort if that's you know, an appropriate situation for you. Um, and then there are, of course, outsourced services that you could look at. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit. But there are a lot of options, and um, it takes some, you know, some effort to evaluate that kind of thing. So it may or may not be completely appropriate for your institution. So what considerations, what other things do we want to make clear? Um, multiple geographically distributed copies. And I think you know, um, the recent events with Hurricane Sandy can pretty much illustrate this for me. Um, say you were, and I actually can't recall if we have any institutions represented here from the, you know, um, <clears throat> the hurricane damaged areas, but if you were um, an institution in, you know, New York or New Jersey and you had um, all the copies of your content even if they were backed up multiple times, if they were all located within that same geographic region and Hurricane Sandy hits and things are underwater and the power is out, um, your content is in immediate danger of being lost. So um, it's really beneficial for you to back up your content, um, to store it in more than one geographic region. For example, um, we at my office, we use um, the Amazon S3 cloud server to back up certain things. And we have chosen to have a copy backed up here in our office, and then there's a copy um, backed up on a server in California. So you can choose those options with um, some of the providers. So think about that. Um, and then your storage partners, again, I mentioned before, um, it's a really good option if you have this. If you have that type of relationship with an institution, that um, is not in the same town or the same, hopefully even the same state as you. Um, if you have that option to work with a partner, that's fantastic because you can, you know, um, you can you can own it and you can have control over it. But you really need to make sure that you have a clear um, understanding and agreement when you're working with partners, and that you're all on the same page as far as what are your responsibilities in um, managing the storage for someone else. And hosted services. So there's a ton of them. I've mentioned um, Amazon S3 because it's just an easy thing that we use. That's by no means a preservation strategy, but it's, it's something. Um, the one uh, service that um, Library of Congress has included in these slides is a service called DuraCloud. And I, I'm not, going to go into it too much now, you, you can, uh, there's tons of information about it on their website, but it's basically a, a tool that was designed to take advantage of cloud storage for, for stuff, clouds? <laughs> cloud storage for preservation. So basically what it does is allows an institution to um, input um, deposit content and the DuraCloud service makes that content, um, separates it geographically so it will be saved multiple copies will be saved at different locations on different servers throughout the country and it might even be international, I'm not really sure. So it takes the, these you know, principles that we've already talked about and puts them into action. Uh, it's sort of like a turnkey kind of thing for you. So you know, it's, just, it's an option to consider. Now I'd just like to pause quickly and do a quick poll with you all just to see what 
what you guys are doing um, with cloud storage. So is can if you could answer this poll quickly, I'll give you a few seconds. Basically, I just want to know if your institution is using any type of cloud storage for anything at all. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be like a preservation strategy. It could just be backup or whatever. And it looks like some people are still answering, so I'll give you just another quick second. Okay, looks like we've got most of the votes in. Okay, so I'm going to I am going to close the poll and share the results with you. So you're seeing now that we have um, only 15% of people are saying yes, our institution is using cloud services in some way. Most of you say no, and, and some do not know. Um, now. I wanted to ask this question for a couple of reasons. Um, one is just to illustrate that cloud storage is used, um, and even you know, even from my perspective, having worked directly with the Amazon S3 cloud, um, it, it was very easy to put into place, and you know, um, something I would try and use more frequently. Um, the other reason I wanted to bring this up was just to kind of make the point that. Even though um, you know cloud storage is it's sort of new, but it's sort of old. Like it's been around for a while, and some people don't know anything about it. Um, but it's just so it's getting more and more common. It's getting more and more cost effective. And I know it's not um, necessarily a preservation strategy in itself to back up things to a cloud server somewhere, but it is really easy, um, and it, it's pretty cost effective. So. If you feel like you're a little overwhelmed by all of the stuff I've been talking about with storage, um, trying out a cloud service, you know, as a backup for backup copies of your content, it's a good first step, you know, and it, it, making that extra copy is, is certainly better than nothing. So if you're feeling a little like, well, I don't know where to start with this or what to do, um, it really it could be a viable option for you, and that's why I wanted to bring it up today. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so let's talk about uh, repositories a little bit. Now, um, there are different types of repositories, and you know, when I when I say repository, differentiate that from just a storage concept. But a repository kind of has the connotation that there is some sort of um, organization to it. There's some um, hopefully some preservation methods behind it. So that's what I, I'm thinking about when I say repository. So there's um, you know different types that are out there. There's general repositories that will pretty much accept whatever type of content that you would like to store. And then there's specific uh, ones dedicated to formats. Um, and you know I, I didn't find one in when I was looking for one, but the one I think could be out there and, and useful would be if you have like a lot of um, research data um, and that type of thing. I, I'm sure that there's like a specific way that needs to be stored. So that might be a, a time when you would need a special repository for your data if you have some unique and specific content. Now, as I mentioned um, before, there's you know always the open source versus proprietary question, of course. Open source repositories, they're, they're available. Um, they take more, probably, um, staff time and expertise to manage if you're using it internally. Um, but if you have that expertise in-house, they potentially could be a cheaper option than using a proprietary repository, um, which is designed to be more turnkey and to take care of the management and the technical aspects for you, but of course, it will cost more. So you have to, you know, uh, see what what your see what's appropriate for your institution. Sometimes, um, even if something costs money, um, you know, this happens a lot in my institution. We don't have a lot of technical expertise in the office, and so we just decide that we will pay a little more to have things managed, you know, by experts. And along the same lines, you know, there's easy to advance uh, types of repositories and. It could even be that um, um, a repository is, for example, an open source repository. Perhaps um, it's you have the technical expertise to run it in-house, um, and it's pretty cheap. 
However, the level of skills and expertise needed um, for your frontline staff to interact with it and make deposits, maybe that's really advanced. So perhaps that's not a good option. You know, so you have to fit, you have to decide um, what's appropriate for your institution. Now, obviously, all of these different systems uh, have pros and cons, and you know, no system is fully compliant to the standards. And that's for a lot of reasons, basically because even though digital preservation is not a new concept, it's really an up and coming field. And there's a lot of scrutiny on the field now and a lot of people talking about it. And things are changing from day to day. So there's really no like 100% perfect repository or place that you could you know, put your content. Um, but there are options that will work for you out there. So that's basically you know, my advice is to just find the option that works for you because you're probably going to have to change it at some time in the future. And that's sort of where we've ended up here, um, sort of near the, near the tail end of our uh, content in the presentation today, is thinking about now that we've talked about all of these storage ideas and issues, um, where is that leading us? And where does this fit within the grand scheme of digital preservation in general? Um, all the things we've talked about today, I think, um, hopefully have led you to understand that you need to develop policies regarding your storage. And so when you're going through all these steps and looking at these issues and making decisions about storage and why you're choosing certain things and what's appropriate for your institution, um, you can coalesce these things into a storage management policy that should really become part of a larger digital preservation plan that hopefully you'll be able to, to work on. Um, and within your you know, storage management, you're, you're going to deal with a lot of different things, including number of copies, locations, partners, et cetera, all the things we've talked about today. Um, you'll also, within your larger digital preservation plan, need to um, record all the information about your decisions regarding um, any services that you're using or any agreements that you have with partners. Now, whether you're working with a, a partner institution to store content or whether you are outsourcing the whole thing to a vendor, um, you need to have very clear agreements in place, uh, clear contracts. In the case of vendors, um, you'll almost always have a contract and you need um, all the responsibilities to be spelled out. And that's, you know, responsibilities on both sides. On the, the side of you, your institution, what are my responsibilities for getting, getting your content into the storage system? And then what are the um, partner or vendor responsibilities for, you know, maintaining it um, in that type of thing? And also, we talked a little bit about uh, the fixity issue, but I think, you know, when you think about storage in, in the whole grand scheme of digital preservation, hopefully you've come to the understanding that you need to monitor your content for errors and change. Now, um, this is particularly important um, leading up to the next webinar in the series that we'll hopefully be holding in the spring. Um, and that webinar is talking about uh, protecting your content. So um, monitoring for errors and change um, is important in the storage environment. It's also particularly important when you talk about protecting your content. Um, so think about that and, you know, you can see how these things sort of all basically fit together. And then in the same vein, now that we're, you know, we've made our decisions on storage, we're putting them into a policy, we have agreements in place, we're monitoring the situation, this will this all leads itself to um, planning for media replacement. And you need to do this because, I mean, obviously, no type of storage media is going to stay constant forever. Um, and so when you're um, monitoring your content, you're hopefully evaluating the effectiveness of your storage media and um, keeping tabs on it and, and making decisions uh, to plan for replacement as needed before you start to lose data. Um, so these are all important things to keep in mind um, when you're 
making decisions on storage, and this will give you an idea of how this fits into preservation planning, digital preservation planning in general, and will foreshadow a little bit of what you're going to hear in the upcoming webinars in the spring. Now, we talked about a lot of stuff today, um, and there was a lot going on in the first webinar series too. Um, we've, we put together a pretty long list of resources for you, which will actually be sent out um, from the webinar organizers, and you'll also receive a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. Um, but it's a really long list, and there's um, some really you know general stuff and some specific stuff. So I wanted to just pull out a couple things, a few things that I think are particularly useful. Um, and, and the first one is kind of a general digital preservation resource. It's called The Signal. And it's the Library of Congress's digital preservation blog. And it's a really, really good blog because it, um, it deals with you know, general concepts. It deals with specific things like metadata. Um, the people that contribute to the blog are active digital preservation practitioners. So they're involved with the conferences, the articles, the research, you know, any standards, up and coming standards, you know, so this is a really great place to get a good, you know, overview of the whole um, DP universe. And they post things on it all the time, but they do kind of like a monthly um, newsletter type of release, which highlights all of the things that have gone on that month. So I really, I highly recommend this resource. Um, another one that, that I found um, pretty useful is this 20 questions for providers resource, and that's from the um, Northeast uh, Document Conservation Center. And this is a, it's a, it's a nice uh, PDF, it's not terribly long, and it's not terribly technical, but it's um, 20 questions that will help you evaluate a provider or know what questions to ask. And this is actually useful, um, not even just in a situation where you're working with a partner or a vendor, but even if you're going to be trying to do your storage internally. Um, there's a lot of great questions in there to get you thinking about the appropriateness of the system you're using, and that kind of thing. And the last resource I'm highlighting on this slide is um, a, a nice article about the digital preservation metadata standards. And, you know, we kind of, we did spend a fair amount of time talking about metadata in this webinar today, but we actually really breezed through it. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, um, premise and some of the other digital preservation metadata standards, you know that it can get a little hefty and a little technical, and, and I find it um, it's, can be slightly intimidating, you know, if you, don't, if you don't know a lot about it yet. So I really like this article because um, it just made it easier for me to understand and um, it's a pretty good read. So I would highly recommend um, checking out these resources plus the other ones that we're going to send to you in the PDF. So um, with that, we're ending the content part of the presentation today, and um, I just want to, you know, thank you for attending um, and thank Alex for having us. And we will, um, we do have time to take some questions at this point. So what I'm going to do is, um, hopefully, Aaron will be able to be unmuted, and Aaron's going to look at any questions that are put into the chat and um, she'll be able to read them out, and then we can um, try and respond to them for you. Yes, actually, Laura, there, there is one question. Um, okay. It is, can you give us examples of preservation metadata that includes the fields you mentioned um, in the slide that discussed context, fixity, reference, provenance, and context? Yes. Um, the the, preser the uh, premise metadata um, I won't open the PDF now. There's a lot of um, information on premise out there in the world, but the premise metadata standard is um, takes all of those things into account. And if you want to start by actually reading this article just to get an idea of what it's like, there's actually a whole you know a whole uh, web page devoted to premise, and there's lots of different examples of it. And um, there have been some actual recent developments on premise. Um, I've seen them coming through the uh, digital preservation listservs that I'm on. So I'm sure if you went um, to the Library of Congress, you'd be able to get a good overview of premise from there. Um, and I'm trying to think if I had any other resources that made it 
easy to understand, but you know, I would start with that. Yeah, I might just add that um, the premise website would be a great place to go, as well as the um, report that Laura cited on her slide from 1996, because I think that's where those terms were originally defined. And they've sort of worked their way um, into the preservation sort of metadata language. Um, but content might be something I, that really, I think, refers to the file itself or the object itself. So file format might be MIME type, whether that's an image, audio file, video file, things like that. Fixity usually, in most cases, usually refers to something like a checksum value, if you are doing checksums on um, your objects. Um, it might also refer to audits that are done then on on the checks and values or the authenticity, the validity and verification of your files, something like that. Reference, um, usually that may refer to something like a unique identifier, so that could be an internal identifier or um, some kind of system identifier that's assigned. It could be also referring to external identifiers like ISBN numbers or OCLC numbers or barcodes. Um, provenance usually um, refers to um, kind of the story of the, of the file, so things that may have been done to it within the system, as well as um, maybe its provenance before it came into a system and got stored. So that usually refers to like preservation events that have been performed, like migration or um, an update to the file. And then context, I think, is more about relationships to other intellectual or technical components. Um, it may also refer to any kind of ownership or rights, something like that. But I would definitely check out the Preserving Digital Information Report as well as the premise schema. It's a whole data dictionary of um, data elements. Well, it, it looks like I'm just checking the clock here. We're about two minutes um, away from 3 o'clock. And I know that um, uh, the organizers wanted to do a quick wrap-up before they let you go. So maybe we'll stop the questions at this point, And we'll certainly um, take all the questions that were put into the question area. And we will um, respond to those. And that will be sent out to everyone um, by the organizers. So um, thank you so much for having us here today. And you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint and the resources. And um, that's all I have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura and Erin, for enlightening us on this important topic in the digital age. Our appreciation goes as well to all of you attending this webinar today. Please take a few minutes. Please take a few minutes to fill out the brief evaluation form that you will receive online and return it to us. Your comments and suggestions will help the ELECT CE committee plan future continuing education offerings. Also, if you have an idea for a webinar, feel free to submit a proposal using the online form found on the ELEX website. ELEX offers an array of online learning opportunities. On the screen, you can see the upcoming webinars in our regular webinar series, Holdings Comparisons, Why Are They So Complicated?, and Transitioning from Cataloging to Creating Metadata. Also future, featured are the first two webinars that Alex will offer in Spanish as part of the RDA series, Elementos RDA and Mark 21, para registros de autoridad de nombre, partes 1 y 2. This is the Spanish equivalent of the recent September 12th webinar, Recording RDA Elements in Mark 21 Fields in Name Authority Records. In addition to the webinars, Alex offers web-based courses of four weeks duration on a variety of subjects, the next one being Fundamentals of Collection Development Management. The CE Committee also schedules e-forms on a monthly basis that have become very popular. Alex members as well as non-members are welcome to participate in these forums. Please visit the Alex website for details about all our continuing education offerings. As we conclude this afternoon's broadcast, I would like to thank Eva Sorrell, member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee's Technical Support Subcommittee, as well as Julie Reese and Vicki Grzynski in the ELEX office for their assistance. Once again, on behalf of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, I would like to thank all of you present here today. 
We hope that this webinar has been of interest to you and look forward to welcoming you at another Alex webinar in the future. Have a great day.